up? We are Wrong Child, and you're watching A Sides. So I've been. Uh, oh. Yeah. So I don't know. I've been stockpiling songs um, for years that didn't fit easily in one category or another, and songs that were really personal and songs that I just. Um, more kind of kept private, and when I had enough of those, more of like a body of work, uh, we decided that it, was, it was enough to make a real uh, album. And that's when the band was born. Yeah, um, actually, Aaron was kind of a big part of that conversation. We were making the record, and it was kind of assumed all right, so yeah, I was born with the name Matt Devine, D-E-V-I-N-E, -E, and it, my whole life people have kind of wondered if it was like a stage name or something, and I just always thought as a stage name, it's about as douchey as you can get. <laughs> like, so people think that that's what I would come up with as a stage name, um, then it's just, you know, it's awful. So, um, also I just can't picture, I don't know, I can't picture selling a t-shirt that just says my name on it. It's just, it's, it's a, I think there are wonderful things to being transparent about, you know, if you are a solo artist and that is who you are. And, um, but there are also a lot of traps where you can really come off douchey. And also it became a band, you know, it became like uh, an actual identity and an actual sort of world. And uh, Aaron and I had a kind of an argument that Probably our shortest argument. I think it was only like maybe two hours. <laughs> and uh, he just reversed the whole thing. And, and yeah, we just wanted to create something that was larger than just me. And there is something about about a band name. When, when I picture a solo artist, I picture them sitting there with a guitar. And that's it. That's all I picture. When, when there's a band name, you have this sort of limitless ability to create, like he said, like a whole world that is so much more expansive than just a person's name. I mean... It, Who's Matt Devine? Right, yeah. <laughs> it just, you, it's, it's, it, it stops at the person when, it, when you give it your name. It just, it's, that's the image, it's just you and that's it. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's, it's fine if that's what you're doing and for a lot of things you wouldn't need anything else beyond that. But There's something nice about like just take, as a solo artist, like where you to just take your guitar and get on a plane and go to Cuba, then you're playing a show in Cuba. It's that simple, it's that clean, you know? But this is a much larger enterprise, and um, yeah. You can't go to Cuba, Americans aren't allowed. You can, it's just not. You can't, you just have to fly to Toronto. Well, you can't Toronto. just fly straight there. <laughs> All right. So it's not that simple. Don't try to fly straight to Cuba, it won't work. You have to go through Toronto or Mexico. <laughs> I love that description. Yeah, that's, I've, I, never I, heard that. I've never heard that, but that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, the era of John Hughes films, you know, the late 80s. We grew up in the Chicago suburbs, so that's part of why everything we do sounds like it comes from a John Hughes movie. I mean, it's, uh, there is something to that. Yeah. There is something to that. <laughs> but in terms of, like, it's those purpose, tunes, though. you think about, like, The Smiths or Psychedelic Furs or um, Simple Minds or those bands that were in those soundtracks. Man, they were, they're some of the, the coolest songs of all time. Um, so I don't know how I, I describe it. I, I always hate describing what we sound like. I've, I've been kind of calling it dark pop, you know? Back in the day, they, I mean, I just hate that question just in terms of strangers on the street. Oh, you. Put yourself in a box. With, yeah, like, with, with the sound of the record, though, you know, when, when, I, when I came into it, he had songs that were, in a lot of ways, sort of, stripped down and were just the song you know there, there wasn't uh, a world around it yet and so you have to figure out what you know how are you gonna paint behind this and there was something there's something about what he's doing as a singer and songwriter that seemed like hearkening for me coming in and doing like figuring out what the keyboard and drum kind of palette was gonna be for the the record there was something about uh, that era, which part of it's our age, you know, where we were kids during that time, we really did grow up watching those movies. Not that I, not that we set out to make a John Hughes soundtrack, it, but 
it that I can see how that happened or how it seems that way to other people because we it's just it was the right your life. yeah and it's the right it was the right way to paint behind him like when it came to like what kind of keyboard like I was targeted about using like keyboard sounds from a certain period of the eighties that that. Uh, would would re recall that time for people not because we wanted it to sound like John Hughes but this but subconsciously I think we probably were kind of pulling from that kind of a vibe just because that is who we are we are children of the 80s that grew up watching John Hughes movies living in John Hughes country and <laughs> even you know, live even <laughs> live like with my pedals and so I try to get that like glossy sort of 80s sound that's kind of like just shimmery and so yeah, it just sort of seems right I guess yeah or you could just say alternative no <laughs> that's a meaningless term if ever there was one yeah that's the <laughs> joke <laughs> <laughs> I think that one's done <laughs>
Mm. It's a, like I was saying. Should have let him finish. <laughs> yeah. Wait, it's Gene Simmons is Gene the guy. Gene Simmons it, it dismisses the Velvet Underground as being less significant than Kiss as a thing that came from New York. Right there, I no longer right. listen to anything that guy says about anything. And if you've seen the YouTube video of him having sex, I think oh, you pretty God. much never Why want to see him it? or hear him ever right, again. Look, just because a guy has an awful sex tape doesn't mean he can't make a decent point. No, no it wasn't a decent point, though. It's not a good point. Everybody right, well, had an awful sex tape. As long as there are people who are individuals, oh. to answer the question seriously, as long as there are people that are individuals that grow up with their own individual concoctions of music that they're influenced by, and then they combine themselves in different ways to make different things, there will always be new things to be done. And anytime someone says there's nothing new under the sun, they're completely, completely missing the fact that that will never be true. That will never, it's ever, ever be true. It's clear that he's very, feels very self-important. Yeah, he's just, well, he, yeah. And he's, if he thinks he's almost dead, then rock and roll is dead. Yeah, his, well, his he, version of rock and roll was dead alive. I hate kids. Right, yeah. which is terrible. <laughs> the, I yeah. say the golden, never the golden that, era yeah. of rock and roll is certainly gone, you know, like, there is a... Because it was new at that time. The infancy of but it, there yeah. Will, but there will always be reinventions and, um, you know, people adapt. I remember the first time I heard... I remember thinking that myself uh, before I heard My Bloody Valentine. I was like, look, there are so many strings on the guitar. There's so many notes in the scale. What else can people possibly do? Then I heard My Bloody Valentine. I was like, you know, blew my mind. So Yeah, Kevin um, Shields is definitely some of the people who did something yeah. new at a time in a way that with something that didn't seem fresh and then all of a sudden it was because he had a fresh perspective. Right. Exactly. And there will always be people doing that. And there yeah. is there is, you know, to what he said, there is I think in the term rock and roll, you know, there is there is a, a sort of danger and abandon to that, which people I think need to kind of refine in a sense. I happen to believe the rock in general as a you know just landscape right now is kind of bland it is kind of safe it is kind of you know played out but i think it's just waiting for probably some 16 year old in iowa right now to do something but that's crazy. the thing at any point in history you could drop in you could drop into 1992 or 1984 or 2003 whatever and you'll find like 90 percent of what was going on at that time was dead and boring the, the point, though, is that there was oh, there's always a 10% factor. There's always somebody 10 coming up. 10% that lives on. Yeah, or that does something that will rise up to be doing something that will remain, uh, that will be memorable and, and fresh sounding and, and new. And, yeah. and it will it'll always be in that same kind of percentages. It know. is understandable, though, for him to say, to turn on radio right now, you can understand why someone would say rock is dead. You turn on radio, everything's it's, electronic it's almost now. all yeah. lifeless yeah. electronic pop. Yeah. So I hear him. But he is wrong. That's such a cool question. I can, you can go around. Apple Jacks. Like, without a doubt, Fruity Pebbles. And that's not like, I understand that makes me look a little kind of, <laughs> maybe that's predictable. But holy shit, is that good. Fruity, just the thought of it, just like purple is a fruit. I grew up on just pop tarts. I like fluffy charms. Yeah, fluffy charms. Fluffy Frosted fluffy flakes were my charms. jam. Did you the did you Canadian pick out the, the the food part and eat just the marshmallows? Sometimes, depending on the day. Okay. You still. Okay. What about when the milk? What was your favorite? What about when the milk got all waxy after? After. <laughs> after I don't know. I usually eat. Yeah. What about that, then, Camille? What about that? <laughs> what's you, your favorite did cereal? Did you think about that before <laughs> no, you started? No, I didn't think about that when I was a kid. My favorite cereal was, um, I, I don't know, Kix. It's you like, didn't eat cereal. Okay, yeah, uh, Kix, I'll say. Because That's such it's, a grown up yeah. boy. Kit tested like, uh, Jeffrey approved. It's like kind of sweet, you know, but it's also kind of bland, so That's I didn't true. feel too bad about, you, you know. You feel guilty yeah. about eating cereal as I used to put sugar on Frosted Flakes and eat it with whole milk. Gross. Well, <laughs> Jeffrey's answer is the answer of someone that was raised in a cult. Right. Um, my my father's a pastor, so I have, a, I have a lot of Christian guilt. So it's like, you know, the kicks were a safe, uh, pious my, thing to eat. My parents raised me unable. To, I mean, they they didn't permit sweet cereal or any of that stuff. Right. So I literally had to sneak. I once snuck through my friend's window to eat his <laughs> like sweet cereal. To eat his fruity pebbles. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. we don't I'm need to kidding. hear about you. Thank you for the window to eat your friends' fruity pebbles, all right? Oh, great. <laughs>
But that's true. See, whenever we have a discussion like this, Camille always turns it to. I'm Nicole. sorry. She's it's in a, a dirty. A peanut dirty gallery land. that's within <laughs> the ga- like peanut galleries are supposed to be over there. She's right next to you. <laughs> you, you would think you would think that like four dudes would turn it dirty, but like she's always the one that's like. I can't help myself. 